but my name is Greg Benick, and I'm here today with Jeff Garrett. We're going to answer a few questions about his career and whatnot. And Jeff, let's just uh, dive right in. Thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Greg, for having me today. Absolutely. So, so tell me, how did you how did you get your start in coins? I'm I'm most interested. You know, your bio is online. We know many people know the things that you have done. I'm I'm almost more curious always about the human element behind the bio. So how did you get your start in coins? What year was that? And how did that go about? Well, in the late 60s, um, I got started like millions of other people did. Uh, a friend of my family gave me a uh, Lincoln Penny book from 1941 to date at that time, I guess in the 60s. And uh, they, you know, got just, you know, told me about coin collecting. The uh, friend of my family's, uh, he, he was a, a, an amateur collector, and uh, he gave me the book and then I was I started filling the album and uh, like you know we all know the magic of Whitman folders it's an addictive behavior and uh, I became I'm, I'm I sort of like uh, uh, I was a perfect sucker for that because I'm I'm real uh, kind of anal about everything anyway I like I like I like everything in its order and complete so I started putting it together and um, then I started realizing that some of these are actually kind of hard to find and I would look and my mom and dad would take me to the bank and I would get a couple of dollars with the pennies and I go back and I go through them. And fairly soon I had it pretty, pretty complete. Um, and then uh, I made my first numismatic purchase. I couldn't, I lived in uh, Clearwater, Florida area and I couldn't find a 1941 S because I guess the S mints and I'm sure I could have found one eventually, but I was impatient. So uh, I went, uh, I think I must've been a I'm not sure how even in those days how it did. It was probably a newspaper ad I saw, but I bought a 1941 S penny from uh, Littleton Coin Company. So that was my first uh, numismatic purchase. And uh, yeah, but really what the, the for, for me, the really the thing that that helped me get started in coins and, and uh, you know, going actually fairly, you know, young as a professional, probably 16 or 17, I was uh, doing being a, uh, I was a professional, but uh, I grew up in Clearwater, uh, Tampa uh, uh, area. And that was really key to uh, me being able to get into coins and and being able to um, you know have the opportunities that I did in Clearwater, Florida, back in the late '60s, early '70s. There were a lot of coin clubs. There were probably five or six in the area. So basically, every week there was a coin club meeting somewhere, one of the towns. And I was really lucky that I had some mentors that um, I guess they they saw in me that. Uh, uh, I really love coins and, you know, I was, you know, like the young kid that, you know, kind of like, I don't know, by the time I was 14 or 15, I was, you know, considered like a whiz kid with it. So they would like come and pick me up. My, my dad traveled out of work, so he was never home, but they would pick me up and take me to the coin club meetings. And then um, afterwards, I would, you know, they'd all meet at Denny's and I'd get to, you know, talk coins with them and, and things like that. And then also uh, in that area was a Clearwater Coin Show, which was kind of famous uh, in Florida. It still used to be a really big deal. Um, and we would go to that once, you know, once a year. And uh, so it really was, it was the comp, it was my luck of uh, growing up in Clearwater, Tampa area, that I was able to have some mentors that really kind of, you know, got me into it, gave me opportunities to learn. I would ride my bike to a coin shop in Dunedin, uh, Florida, that a guy named Ed French ran. And I would help him like, uh, you know, flip coins and do, you know, things you do in a coin shop. And, and it was a, you know, typical hole in the wall, hole in the wall place. But uh, I was just really in the right place at the right time to be able to, you know, be exposed to coins. So it was really a lucky time. That's amazing. Now, what do you think it is that defines a whiz kid at 14 or 15? What was it about you that made you stand out from all the other kids? Was it your, uh, you know, ability to memorize? Was it your grading ability at the time? What, what do you think it was? Um, that's, that's a good question. You know, it's really kind of a combination of, of those. So grading, I was really good at grading, like really quickly. I kind of understood that. Um, I had a really good memory for coins. I still do. I, I, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, but I can remember a coin that I, I sold a year ago. Uh, just say just somehow that vision uh, that, you know, I have a, like a photographic memory for coins, but it doesn't apply to anything else. So it's, it's really, really a strange, strange thing. And, um, and also I was really good with counterfeit detection for some reason I could, you know, I could uh, unidentified counterfeit gold. Um, so everyone was already by the time I was 15 people were asking me for advice it was it was kind of kind of funny. And um, also fairly soon I became like a pretty good trader I could, I could see a coin and, and uh, figure out what it was worth and you know, uh, and, and I, I kind of kid people because now, you know, now I'm editor of Redbook and back in the 70s 
you know, the Red Book was really an important thing. And so I, I did everything I could to like memorize the Red Book. And then um, another thing that really kind of like, I, I started understanding early on that um, information was really key. And edu- I guess, I don't know if education is the right word for it though, then, but I was like, the more you know, the more you can make kind of thing. I figured that out really fast. And I remember when uh, David Aker's books came out in the 70s. And I was like, wow, this is really great information. You know, Red Book is, you know, you could, you know, look at memorize Red Book, but that was managers and, and prices. But, you know, Dave uh, Ager's books were the first one that had like narrative about this coin, you know, being, you know, maybe it's listed in Red Book, but it's actually unknown in, in Mint State and that, that kind of stuff. So I I, I started, uh, you know, I, I early on, I just realized the more you know, the more you can make. And I kind of like, you know, made that, you know, a staple of my, uh, uh, you know, how I did business. Because I, I, you know, I would suggest, and I'm not, I'm not Greg explaining this to you. You know this already, yeah. but you know those little pieces of information make the difference. If you know that the red book says this, but this coin is unknown in mint state, and that coin comes up for auction, and it happens to be in mint state, that little piece of information is is huge. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely immense. Yeah, it was what big, was it? and then you know long, later on, I actually um, I learned that um, you know there was ways to find that information too. Uh, you know, many years later, uh, John Danrother and I um, started uh, compiling auction records. We were one of the first ones that did that. We uh, we would go in, we started a database and we eventually sold it to PCGS. And now it's, you know, part of the their whole, you know, what, you know, what everyone uses now. Now people use auction records for pricing pretty much more than than than, than price guides. So yeah, I remember I had bought a, uh, we had started that project. We hired college students to take auction catalogs and, and put them in an Excel file. And then later we had to use uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, databases. But I remember buying an 1841 Quarter Eagle and I saw the auction records that were like, they were all bringing twice what they were bringing in catalog. And I, I, I capitalized on that at, at a coin show. And I was like, wow, we got to really, we got to amp it up. So we hired more people and it, you know, ended up that's, you know, now, even today, now it's like, it is, it's the way most people price coins is auction, is prices realized. How many, how many auction records did these college students type in, do you think? Oh, it was tens of thousands, tens, tens. Of, I remember we had to, we eventually got beyond Excel. It was, and I, I, uh, I had to ask John which database we went to next, but you know, he was more the tech guy and he, uh, we ended up having to buy something else that was bigger that could, could, could control more, uh, more data. And, um, you know, up until about 10 years or so ago, a lot of it was done by hand It's now it's just, just, it's in the last 10 years that now the auction companies, you know, they download it into databases and it goes up to, Collectors Universe gets it, and then you know all you know Coin Gray Sheet gets it, and you know so you can that information now is consolidated, and you can get it at your fingertips. You know that you've taken on a large coin task when you when you go past the capability of Microsoft when Excel just isn't enough. You're like you're silly small company. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to deal with somebody bigger for the project yeah. that we're doing. Yeah, That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the Red Book, and of course, growing up, uh, the Red Book was was everything. And I would look forward to it coming out and just look at, of course, compare old prices to new and whatnot. What was it like getting involved in the Red Book? I mean, sure, you know, we, I'd be happy to talk about what you do for the Red Book right now, and please feel free to mention that in case people don't know. But what, what did it feel like going from growing up reading the Red Book to then working on the Red Book? You know, it's it's kind of like a slow boil. You know, like the you know you put a frog in, in a boiling water. You don't know it because it goes so slowly. So I I got my exposure to Red Book is really a slow process. I um, you know probably you know I, I you know I was, I was a coin trader for most of my career until about fifteen or twenty years ago, and then uh, I was I had this idea about uh, the hundred greatest coins. You know, it's like everybody's like, well, what's the most expensive coins? I said, what? Well, they have an interesting book. What's the most expensive? You know, the greatest coins. So um, Ron Guth and I, uh, one of my great friends in the business, we uh, uh, we worked together on it, and we put together the hundred greatest coins. And I went to the idea with Whitman Publishing, and my, I think it might, I guess it was Whitman. It might have been even different company by you know, at that time. And we told them that uh, by the idea, and they liked it. And uh, we so we we published this book, and then we had prices in there. So they kind of established my relationship with Whitman, the company. And then I would help them, um, you know, that, that book, that book became very, very popular, one book of the year and, and uh, you know, it's in this fifth edition and it's still, still really, really, uh, you know, useful book a lot of people like, um, but it, it kind of got me in uh, working with them, like they would like, 
they would call up and say, oh, there's a guy doing a book on uh, Buffalo Nichols, but we need pricing for it. So I would, I would, you know, help them with the pricing for it. And then eventually um, there was, they'd had some help. They wanted me to help them with the gold coins because I, I eventually did a book, uh, Encyclopedia of U.S. Gold with Ron Gutt as well. And um, that was a multi-year project. Pro, uh, multi-year uh, uh, adventure. It took a long time to get it done. And then that book had pricing on it. So I created a database to do pricing for that. And then they asked me to help with the pricing for gold coins for Red Book. Then I started working with Ken Brissett and we, so we worked on that. And I would do every year for you know a few years, I would do the pricing for gold, uh, kind of what they call finalizing where you know they have contributors, but someone has to take the contributors prices and put in the final, final price. And then even then I was putting in the prices, but Ken Brissett would overlook it and he would be the ultimate finalizer. But um, I did 99%, 95% of the work. Uh, so we did that. And then uh, then eventually they asked me to, you know, Ken was uh, wanting to, you know, slow down a little bit. So they, uh, you know, it, I guess he was getting in his late eighties and he said, you know, I wanted to, you know, finally slow down a little bit. So I started doing more of the book. And then eventually I was doing uh, sort of like an apprenticeship. Uh, I was doing the, um, you know, all the, the entire book, but it was still as a, uh, I guess, a pricing editor. I think they called me a, a valuation editor. That's what I was called. So I did that. And, you know, and I, I really, you know, I love the Red Book and I've been involved in it. I mean, I've been not involved in it, but, uh, you know, I've used it as a tool for, you know, my whole life. So it's been something I really care about. And um, so eventually, you know, worked on it some more. And then, then, then at some point, um, they um, wanted to, you know, I got the big honor of having my name moved to the front of the book as, as valuation editor with Dave Bowers as research editor and Ken Brissett as editor. So that was like, you know, that was one of my, you know, uh, you know big achievement for me numismatically. So I was pretty happy about that. And then uh, I guess, what is it, 2019, I think it was. So it's about three or four years ago now. Ken Brissett, you know, was uh, 91 or 92 and, you know, still walking four miles a day, but he was wanting to actually fit, really retire. So uh, I took on the job of doing the entire Red Book as a senior editor. So um, so now I'm senior editor. Uh, Ken Brissett's still, you know, fairly, fairly active as far as, uh, you know, if we have a question and something comes up, like, you know, someone question a, min a minage on a coin, they'll, you know, we'll still like, well, Ken, where did that number come from? And he'll say, oh, 1962, we did this, this, and this. So he's, he still has an amazing memory and he, uh, he'll turn 95 this year. And so it's a, it, that's, that's pretty amazing. So, so my involvement in Red Book was a, an evolving process uh, and it's been enjoyable. I, I like it. Uh, I like everything except for like the last month where I have to really put it all together, which is like a really a big giant uh, amount of work. Um, we have a good contributor system. So, um, uh, somebody, uh, someone told me a quote once that I really like from Mark Twain. Uh, someone asked Mark Twain if he, if he, if he enjoys writing and he says, uh, I enjoy having written. <laughs> so, uh, that's, <laughs> so that's kind of how I am. I, I, once I get it done, I'm like, phew, I'm glad that's done. I'll go wait till next year. So it's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's funny. You mentioned the hundred greatest. I actually bought the fifth edition last night. And the reason okay. was yesterday. In anticipation, in anticipation of the interview, I was reading my copy, the copy I've had for years and years and years. And I was looking at it, I was like, oh, the 1913 Liberty Nickel. I got to ask him about the 1913 Liberty Nickel. And then in the first edition, it says only the location of only four of these is known. Yeah. I'm like, probably time for me to get an updated ed edition. So I bought the, uh, the fifth last night. That's great. I was going to ask about valuations because it, there's so many different factors, I assume, that go into valuation. Meaning if someone came to me in five minutes with an 1804 dollar and said, what's it worth? Is it worth 50? thousand dollars I'd say well it's it's worth a lot more than fifty thousand dollars but how do I know that meaning I know that because people have paid that I know that because there's a collective agreement that it is that worth more but what are the other factors that go into valuations and then what about the lesser coins meaning some random standing Liberty quarter that isn't a key date how are valuations defined for an entire realm of numismatics I just it's it boggles the mind to think about yeah, valuation is a mind-boggling experience, and it's it's actually becoming even harder now, because um, uh, years ago, when uh, early in my career, uh, the coin business was kind of dominated by investors. So investors would buy coins back in the '70s and '80s, and they really didn't care what a coin looked like. They didn't well, they didn't know it. You know, they didn't know the difference. So it, they was like they were they were being sold coins or what they were told to buy, but they really weren't um, students of numismatics. 
now the currently the the coin market is really dominated by coin collectors. I mean, that's that's who the real consumers are now, and um, that's evidenced by uh, like even last night there was a, a 1958 penny sold for 1.1 million dollars, which is like that's mind boggling. Yeah. And, um, and so if I, if I had to give you the short answer, uh, valuations based on supply and demand, like everything, and what people, dem the collectors demand now are coins that are attractive. So it's really hard to put in like a price guide, like what is a, you know, a better example would be like an 1894 silver dollar in MS-63. Well, the coin could be worth, you know, uh, $1,500, or it might be worth 3,500, but it depends on what it looks like, really, if it's deeply toned or if it's like radiant luster uh, or beautifully toned there, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors that go in, into valuations of, of a coin. Um, our, for Red Book and for, I think, you know, I talk to other guys like the guys that do Red Book and, and uh, you know, the other things that do price guides. So catalog values are for the theoretically, uh, the theoretical average coin for the grade. So it's a, it's a coin that's totally like right in the middle, not high end, not low end. Um, because uh, you could find extremes on almost every coin that you that you see where one one would be selling, but um, valuations now are a lot to do. You know the supply and demand factor comes in really heavily when these people go to battle for these set registry competitions. So I, I never thought in my career I would see like last night also you know Stuart Blaze collection of Lincoln pennies is what you know what I'm, what I'm referring to. Yeah, course, uh, a, 19, yeah. a 1919 penny sold for four hundred thousand dollars, which you know, I would, you know, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, would a 1919 penny be worth $400,000? I, I would have said, well, got that must make gas, you know, gas must be $500 a gallon by then or something. I, you know, it was something crazy, but um, it was, uh, you know, but it's, but it's, you know, what it is, it's, um, you know, people competing because they want to have the finest known and they want to have the finest known set. And it's probably set registry, um, you know, more set registry driven that, that's, that's making that happen. Um, and that is uh, really uh, you know, that that set registry competition is one of the things that that really kind of like um, it almost distorts the, the, the values because people will pay far more in coins work just because they want to be number one in the set registry. So that's 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 a big, big factor. But in, in general, uh, you know, we use you know, when I'm doing pricing, you know, I, I have to price for a red book, everything from colonials to, you know, double eagles at the back of the book. And that is one advantage that I have that um, probably other previous editors, like even Ken Brissett, he's a brilliant guy, but, you know, I buy and sell millions of dollars worth of coins a year, and I have an intuitive uh, idea of what a coin's worth just by, you know, my handling of coins. So my my job is to know what a coin's worth, and that's what, you know, most high, you know, you know uh, highly skilled professionals have to do. You have to be able to understand, you know, within five or 10% what a coin is probably worth. So before we set off a frenzy, like the era of Max Mel looking for the 1913 Liberty Nickel and having the entire country frantic about looking for this coin, let's point out to viewers that it wasn't just a 1958 penny that sold and not just a 1919 penny that sold uh, because the coins that sold last night, sure, 1958 double die, three known, if I'm not mistaken. Two right? known, I thought. Could yeah, be three. So, could be three, right? So, um, and then the 1919 penny and MS69, you know, graded, beautiful, perfect, like the best grade. of all. Yeah, fantasy, yeah, fantasy grade. grade right? Yeah, uh, these these are exceptional, just unbelievable coins, and yet and yet still, it's like you said, it's just hard to place value. Meaning, I, you know, I didn't happen to have the 1.1 million dollars in my pocket. I'm I'm a, an error guy, right? So I'm on the board at Koneka, and mint errors are basically my life. And yet still, I never would have anticipated that 1958 penny would have sold for that. Like you said, supply and demand, and it's really hard to pin down. If the coin is gorgeous, then it's simply worth more. But it's really good to know that the guidebook, like you said, is a, uh, a baseline for the, for the average coin. That's really good to know because then people can interpret coins as art and then price them accordingly when they see them, really. Yeah, it's funny you, you, talk, you just mentioned the coins as art. So for you know, for a long, long time, uh, people were saying like, you know, really great coins are underpriced compared to like great paintings. You know, it's, you know, there's been coin, there's been paintings bringing a hundred million for, a, you know, for quite a while, you know, 50 million is like, you know, there'll be a painting sale for 30, 40 million. I've never even heard of the artist now. So it's, which is kind of like, you know, and I'm fairly, you know, I read you know, about that stuff pretty often. And the uh, coins have finally kind of come into that realm where the, you know, the, the very like greatest of the great, 
are bringing in like really unbelievable prices. And, and one of the reasons for that is that um, it, it, we have what I call the age of the billionaires, coin collectors. And there right now, there's probably, I, I know four or five of them, uh, you know, for sure, you know, multi-billionaires that have decided that coin collecting is their thing. And they're, they've spent, you know, 200, 300, 400 million dollars on their coin collections, which is staggering amount. And when those guys go to battle for a coin, it's like, uh, you know, lights out. Um, uh, I was just doing the Red Book final prices a couple of weeks ago, and I noticed a 1794 half dollar sold two years ago for what I thought was a staggering price of 850,000 or eight, maybe 880,000, I think what it was, MS64 plus finest known, of course. Uh, and when I when that happened a couple of years ago, I thought, wow, that's that. Yeah, wow, what a how much money for a bus half dollar? It's crazy, and it sold uh, a couple of weeks ago in this last sale for one point eight million. So it, it sold for a million dollars more uh, uh, two years later, and uh, probably because it's a finest known and it's a uh, you know it's a it's a trophy coin essentially, and the billionaires have have done battle, and uh, it, it's it's that that is. Probably, you know, a lot of these headlines we've seen is, is a result of that phenomena, the, the multi-billionaires that, are, that have decided coin collecting. It's like the, uh, the Dan O'Dowd, the tyrant uh, collector. Um, someone in a, did an interview and uh, he, he kind of jokingly said uh, that, you know, a lot of my fellow billionaires have yachts, but I get seasick. So I decided to collect coins. <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> funny that he, that's where he's putting his money. So, but it's, it, it has Amazing. a giant impact on the coin market. Oh, I'm sure it does. Absolutely. Well, let's talk just for a second about uh, about grading. I mean, you're known as a grader, and how how did grading first become important to you? And when did you realize you had these you know these skills? And what were the skills that made you a great grader early on? Um, well, you know, it's, and it's funny. Grading is, a, is has been an evolving process because you know what coins graded. 30 years ago, you know, that's like a glacier. Now it's a little bit different. So it is it's actually a moving target you have to keep up with to, uh, to understand it. Um, I've always known that grading was like a really key to being a successful coin dealer. Um, I actually teach advanced coin grading for the summer seminar at a now uh, in the summer. So I, I, I teach that and we get a lot of, you know, 20 or 30, uh, you know, usually young people who are interested in being professional coin dealers take it. Um, you know, what learn what, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to describe. It's, it's kind of like people will, you know, show me a coin and I'll tell them a grade and they say, well, how do you know? And, you know, and I say, well, you know, like if you show a diamond to a, um, you know, an expert diamond guy, I couldn't tell the difference, but they can tell you if it's a real diamond or not, you know, probably just glancing at it. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's, it, grading is a very nuanced thing. And it's, uh, it's something that you just have to do by experience. And I, I tell people that, uh, you know, I said, you got to start somewhere. I, I tell people like start with Morgan dollars. If you can learn how to grade Morgan dollars. You can maybe extrapolate that to other series because they're big coins. You can see them and you can kind of see the, the things that, that come into it. But it, it's a uh, grading is a very complex. I mean, you know, these days you have uh, it's not about just seeing detail. You got to be able to understand if it's, you know, uh, artificially toned, or if it's got, you know, uh, things you don't see, you know, happen. Um, but I think I think in, in general grading is just something you have to do by experience. And one of the things when I teach my class, I tell people that you can do um, is go to an auction. Look, at, even if you're not going to buy anything, look at auction lots, study them very very carefully. The coin's already been graded by the grading services once, so it gives you one point of reference. Then when the auction results are over, go back and try to figure like why did one bring like twice the catalog price and one bring half the catalog price? Then you can maybe you know see some you know see you know see that actually by looking at them. So, you know, for me, it's just, I, I, I learned by experience and I don't know, I, you know, I guess there's some people have an eye for it, you know, and I've seen times where I've had employees over the years where I've tried to teach them and it goes into one ear and out the other. And some people just, just can't grasp it. So it's, it, it is a, uh, I'll call it a skill and some people have it and some people don't. So that's, that's probably how best way to describe it, I guess. What was it like being one of the early graders at PCGS? I mean, you were there at the, at the very beginning. What was that experience like? Because that was transformative. Yeah, it was really, it was, it was a lot of fun to be there. You know, it was kind of like they were, they first started, they didn't have full-time graders. You'd come out and grade for a week. Um, I lived in Kentucky at the time and I would go to California, live for a week. We'd live in an apartment. It's kind of like a dorm lifestyle. Um, and I enjoyed it. It was, it was fun to do. And you know, we, I, I probably didn't fully appreciate how transformative it was going to be when I was doing it. You know, we were like, wow, this is, 
you know, this is neat to do. And the the great the great thing about being a professional coin grader at a grading company is you get to see so many coins. So you would get to see, you know, everything. I mean, you know, the greatest and the, you know, so it was really very, very educational from that point and uh, that point of uh, perspective. Uh, that might, you know, had probably to help my career later on after, you know, having done that 30 some odd years ago that I was able to see a lot of coins. I knew what the, you know, grading services expected. Um, and, uh, you know, and at the time it was, uh, I don't think, like I say, I don't, I don't really, I probably didn't know that, you know, like it'd be funny, like these first generation coins, I was grading them there. I was probably one that created some of those coins. And now that they're, they're prized, you know, they're prized as their own collectible now. People want those, you know, those rattlers, they call it and, and stuff like that. So it was fun to be in the beginning of it. And then I, I did, uh, eventually I had to make a decision. Do I want to live in California and do it full time? Uh, which uh, I, you know, so, so that's the, that was the positive I learned about it, but the negative it was, I personally don't have the mentality to, to or the mental state to sit in front of uh, a light in gray coins all day long, every day. And I, I want to be on the phone, like, you know, doing a deal or, or going to a coin show. I, I, you know, I, I don't have the, the, um, I guess the attention span to sit, you know, uninterrupted for eight hours a day grading coins. So it really, it's not for everybody. It's, it's something you have to have the right you know, you have to be able to do that and have the right focus and being able to do it. So I, I didn't, I, I could do it very effectively, but I didn't enjoy it. And then at some point I decided that really wasn't going to be the lifestyle I wanted to pursue. So I, I stayed with being a professional coin dealer and, uh, and, and did that, but it was fun to be there in the beginning and, you know, and, you know, also seeing all the great characters, David Hall and all the other, you know, people who are around there. So, you know, eventually it'll, it'll end up being like, you were the kind of like with the legends of numismatics and it was fun to be around when that was going on. Now, I would think that grading coins would be really fun at first. And, you know, I have, I have a friend who's a grader, and I, I think it'd be really fun at first. I think after right. seeing my 35,000th MS64 Walking Liberty half, I think maybe the fun would, <laughs> would diminish slightly. Try, try, grading, but, try grading MS69 and MS70 Silver Eagles all day long for two weeks and see what you like that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, as long as, you're, as long as you're putting great coins in front of me, I could probably get my attention, but it, at some point it gets, it gets kind of dull. And, and it, but it is, it is interesting though, because you do see a lot and especially these professional companies, they've got, you know, people trying to trick them every day, all day with, you know, this or that artificial coins and stuff. So definitely you have to be on their toes. So you, you know, I, I admire what they do. It's a tough job. Absolutely. I can't, I can't imagine the focus and the attention and the skill and the encyclopedic knowledge of coins it would take to do that work. So yeah, it'd be right. pretty amazing. Now for, for those who don't remember and uh, you know, I'm, old enough to remember myself, but describe what happened when PCGS came around and when slabs and grading came around and how that shifted grading. You, you touched on it, but I know I talked to my dad, for example. My dad started collecting 1949, 1950, and he describes going into a coin shop, you'd have a conversation with the dealer. I think it's this, I think it's MS, I think it's, I think it's uncirculated. Really? I think it's XF. And then you just have a conversation, you come to an agreement, that was the grade, and you're good. So what, just, just describe, because it's, I think it's an important, hugely important moment in numismatic history, the shift that happened when all of a sudden we began slabbing coins. Yeah, I mean, before that, there were a lot of guys that would like, they, they, the classic line that a lot of them would say is, I don't grade coins, I price them. So this is what I want for it. You decide what you think it grades. You know, that's the, that kind of mentality. And that was really a big, you know, big part of how people did things. They just like, they, they, uh, a coin had its uh, implied value, but then of course that led to a lot of fraud or, uh, you know, it made it easy for a person to sell an overgraded coin or grossly overgraded coins or counterfeits even. So it was, you know, the, the business, if, if it hadn't been for third-party grading, the coin business would have stayed small. It would have been a small, much, you know, much smaller business. So the the idea, in a, you know, and it's funny, it's even an evolving thing now, like the, the world in ancient market it's just now kind of embracing, you know, uh, what we call third-party grading, and um, you know, a lot of even like ancient coins or even the like the, maybe be the last holdouts. But a lot of those people, oh, I want to hold the coin, and you know, they don't like the grades assigned to it, and all you know, all these things. But it really was transformative in a, in a, in a fact that, uh, and what I mentioned earlier about investors, there were a lot of investors back in the '80s and you know, '70s and '80s. And at first, coins. I don't know if you look at the price guys, but 1989, um, a few years after. Uh, the grading prices skyrocketed. I mean, coins are still not as high as, I mean, a proof three cent nickels in, in 1989, I think were $2,000. Now you can buy them for $400 in gem condition. 
So 35 years later, they have you know, gone down by you know a lot. Um, so what it did is it, it basically commoditized coins where you could like, uh, I want to buy, you know, 200 MS65 Morgans. And I know exactly what they are because they've been certified as MS65. So people like investors like, wow, I'll, we'll have them on the front of the wall. They'll be in the Wall Street Journal before you know it. You know, it's like they'll we'll have a column for stock prices. We'll have a column for coin prices. But of course, coins are so much more nuanced than that. And that all fell apart. And um, you know, prices crash. And by the 90, early 90s, you know, there was like a crash in the coin business. They, they realized that wasn't going to happen. But it was, it, it, it really did transform things where, um, you know, coins, and then in those days, there were still a lot of like fresh collections that were coming out. So it was exciting what they would grade. And, you know, you know, the grading service are seeing all new coins. I mean, it's like so different in those days, everything it was coming in for the first time. You know, now literally, if the grading companies get a, a, a group of vintage coins, they're probably coins that have already been graded once or twice, and people are just trying to get a higher grade and resubmissions or what you call it. So the the days of like the you know getting fresh fresh coins at the grading services, they're, they've dwindled to it's it's a it's a trickle compared to what it was in the in the very beginning. So it made it made a big difference. And then even the grading companies now, the uh, like Mark Salzberg, I've heard it in a little talk he did recently about how they evolved, how they looked at coins like that in those days, we like, oh, we thought a gem had to look like that. But we realized a lot of them, you know, that maybe if you do comparative study that, you know, that's, you know, we might grade, we're getting too strict. And, you know, so it's, it, 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 it uh, it's like a glacier. It's, it evolved over time. Hmm. Tell me this, uh, just shifting gears just slightly, because, uh, you know, I, I could talk about grading all day long. I'm, I'm always in a process of learning myself, yeah. but what are some of your favorite coins that you've handled out of the you know millions of coins or hundreds of thousands or whatever it is that you that pass through your hands every year. I mean, over time, what are some of your the favorite coins that you've handled throughout your your career? You know, probably really the the most important collection that I ever had a chance to handle that was just amazing from you know start to finish was um, I think it was about fifteen years ago or maybe maybe a little bit longer. I lose track. It goes by so fast. But um, Bob Harwell. Um, in Atlanta, Georgia, I had a client who had put together the finest collection of Dahlonega gold. You know, it's called the Duke's Creek Collection. So we bought a complete set of uh, gold dollars, two and a halves, a three and fives. And he had a complete set of Templeton Reed uh, gold coins. And um, at the time, I think it was around $5 million, but um, probably three quarters of the coins were finest known for what they are, for the, for the, for the coin. So it was just, it was an amazing collection of coins and we bought it and broke it up and sold it to various, you know, different people. Um, Mark Salzberg actually still owns the, the set of $5 gold pieces. Uh, it sold to an investor at the time and then uh, somebody that Mark Salzberg knew and he, when he had a chance to buy it about four or five years ago, he bought it intact. So it's, it's the, the ones, the two and a halves bro got broken up and you still see the pedigrees occasionally. Um, Don Kagan bought the, um, the, the uh, Templeton Reed gold, which is a, a two and a half, a five and a 10, when it, and those are mega rare and placed them with a client. But uh, across the board, that was probably the neatest collection I ever handled as far as being the finest known. And also I love US gold coins. It was just really a, a distinct pleasure to own it and have a chance to be involved in it. Are there any coins that you wish you handled? Meaning the the one that got away, those sorts of things. I know that, you know, I've, I've, I've got a, a few of my own certainly, but I'm, I'm really curious to know about yours. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's, it's like this 1919 penny kind of brings it to mind. It's like, if I had my, if I had to go back in time and tell my younger self, I would say, you know, how many times that I own, own like a, you know, a, a, a 1945, you know, a dime and MS 68 that I probably sold for $30 that, you know, if I'd, if I'd had any idea, inkling that, you know, 30 years later, people would pay insane money for, you know, relatively modern coins, like a, a, a set of, you know, Lincoln pennies or, or, or Jefferson nickels and, and things like that. So they might have been the most interesting, but if I'd have, if I'd have, I wish I'd have had the foresight to understand that, you know, superb gems. And, and there's been some people have done that over the, you know, back, back in the day, we, we all thought they were almost kind of crazy. They would pay like crazy money for a coin because it was like, oh, it had unbelievable toning. They pay $300 for Morgan dollars. Like, oh, that's crazy. And now those are, you know, $30,000, $40,000. So it's uh, probably going back in time. I let a, I let a lot of really great you know, superb coins slipped through my fingers that I that I sold that I probably, uh, if I'd had any foresight at all, I would have kept them. So here's an interesting question then, it just came to mind. What are those coins now? Meaning that certainly 30 years from now, people will be sitting around, 50 years from now, gonna be sitting around thinking, man, in, in you know, in, in, in 2022, 2023, 
we had the chance to buy a blank and we just let it go because we thought it was overpriced then. You know, right. there's always that situation of, you know, if, you, if again, if you ask my dad, he'd say, sure, an 1856 Flying Eagle was cheap when he was coming up collecting, but who had the, the money to buy that, no, regardless of how quote unquote cheap it was compared to modern standards? What, what do you think those coins are now? I, I know that's speculative and I know you're not yeah, giving I, investment advice, but. Yeah. Well, I had, that, I had a conversation like this just recently with a, with a friend and, and I, I told him about, it, it goes back to where I told you originally about the coin business is about supply and demand. So if I were to give somebody like came in and said, I really want to buy coins, but I want, you know, I want to learn about them because I always tell people, don't buy anything for investment, you know, try to learn about it, become a collector because you have a much better chance. But the idea that if you buy the keys for almost every series and, and, um, you know, I talked to, I talked to someone today, he, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Rollo Fox and uh, up in Louisville, he put together a, set, a complete set of double eagles and he, you know, he, he started putting it together and, I'm sorry. He uh, he realized that you know you get to this must-have mentality, and you got to pay a lot of money to get like a certain date or whatever. But uh, if you know, he said that now he collects coins by what he calls the box of twenty. So just like a you know he he'll buy like a you know really nice coin, and like that's how he collects now. He doesn't collect by series. He collects a really great you know one one nice great coin. So I think in the long run that you know 40, 50 years from now. Um, you know, in 1881 S Morgan dollar, I don't care how good it, what you think it is, it's still going to be a common coin because there's tens of thousands of them out there. But uh, in 1889 CC dollar and M is 63, that's a good coin, and it's going to be. You know, if if the if the numbers of collectors grow, there's theoretically going to be more people collecting Morgan dollars, and they're going to need those key dates. So I think the supply and demand factor, if you think about it, the focus on key coins, regardless of the series or regardless of the country or ancient coin, modern coin, whatever it is, that that will, that, you know, that I think that you have a, the leverage of demand that'll always be in your favor. And that's what I would, I would think is a good idea. Speaking of, what, what did it feel like when you bought the 1913 Liberty Nickel? I've seen the video and yeah. you were very, uh, what's the word, understated in that moment. If it was, if it was me, I would have done a backflip off the chair and I would have been screaming and yelling. You were very understated, very calm. And what did it feel like to buy the 1913 Liberty Nickel? But it was more of like a shock moment because um, I, I don't know. I've, I've written a couple articles about it, but um, I didn't know I was going to buy that coin and earlier in the day. Uh, I called my good friend, Larry Lee, who I knew had a couple of big clients. I said, Larry, there's a 1913 nickel coming up, but it might sell reasonable um, because other people are. That coin is kind of funny. It's like it's it's a it's such a great classic coin. But now it's it's not even it's not even close. Uh, even now, it's not even close now as far as the most valuable coins. So it's because of so many other coins that have shot up above it, but it still has the best story. It's still a great, you know, it's it's iconic. I said, Larry, this might slip through the through the crack. So, you know, an hour or two before the sale, he, he, he didn't return a call all day. And then eventually he calls me an hour or two before the sale and he says, oh, what do you think it'll bring? And I don't like say, well, I, you know, I think it'll bring under 4 million. I think it, you know, it'll be probably a little over three. And, you know, we're not, you know, we talked about it for a while and he said, well, let's, you know, let's bid this. And so we, you know, I said, I'll take a certain percentage, you do that. And, and then we went to the sale and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, as you've seen the video, it was like sold, you know, and it was, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of shocking. It was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. And uh, we bought it. And I, I did tell someone, it's interesting lately, we've been talking about, it's, it's kind of sad that because of the pandemic, um, auctions now have been driven all online. And, you know, that was probably one of the last, well, there's been a few instances lately, you know, bass sale, you know, they did live and had some clapping, but still not like this was. There were hundreds of people in the room, hundreds. And uh, when the coin went off, it was a roar of applause. I go outside, the press was there, I get interviewed. And, you know, now a coin sells for $8 million and it's like, uh, okay, you know, you know, a little bit like, you know, like that, the next lot, you know, it's like, it's not, it, it you know, the drama of, of that, of the, of the grand auction room is, is really lost to us. And that's really kind of a sad thing because it really was exciting and, uh, you know, wasn't the biggest deal I've ever done in my career, but it was probably one of the more exciting deals I've, I've done. And um, it was one of the, that I'll, you know, I'll always kind of cherish the, the, the evening. And my son was sitting next to me when we did it. And it was a lot of fun to, you know, he had no idea I was even bidding. <laughs> so, you know, it was like, what, what are you doing? And, and uh, it was, it was, it was really kind of, it was, it was something I'll always remember. And, um, I, I can't even believe how fast time goes by, but this year, this the, the Central State Show that's coming up, it'll be 10 years now. It'll, it's been 10 years ago that we did wow. that. So I know it's went by pretty quick. 
Yeah, time just flies. That's amazing. And there is something about the live auction room that just, it can't be replicated. I mean, there's just an, an energy. I remember years ago, I, I flew to Baltimore. I'm from Seattle and I flew to Baltimore to bid on an error coin. It was a counter brockage Liberty nickel. And I had wanted this coin forever. And I flew there and my dad met me. We went to the auction to make a long story very, very short. I bid on the coin and I think my palms are sweating even now, remembering how much my palms are sweating and the energy of it. And the entire experience was just transformative. So I mean, that's why I had to, I had to ask, having seen yeah. that video of you. And yeah, and it's such a shame that that that's not really how it works anymore. So it just it's so much more so much more transactional now than it is or, or is like an experience. You know, something that you would, that you would remember and have fun doing it. It was one of the <laughs> one of my one of my favorite auction stories of all time was uh, John J. Pittman when he was uh, there was an 1854 gold dollar in proof that he knew how rare it was. He was famous for knowing how, you know, being really knowledgeable back in the 60s. And it came up for auction. And uh, he famously is called the, the Statue of Liberty coin. And he went to the front of the room and stood there with his hand up like the Statue of Liberty facing down anybody was bidding against him. And he bought the coin and that, that coin was famous always for that, the Statue of Liberty coin. He, was, he wasn't he was going to anybody outbid him, but he, that's what he did. And I, I got, I had the privilege of handling that coin um, about 10 years ago. I sold it to, well, maybe less than that. To Deloy Hansen, uh, the the another the billionaire collector. So I, I got to sell that coin. It was a lot of fun. That's amazing. That must have been a very intimidating moment if somebody had flown to proverbially Baltimore, right, to to bid on the coin, and then Pittman standing in the front of the room like the Statue of Liberty. That's an amazing Just moment. Facing the audience, it was pretty funny. Now, last question, and you've been really generous with your time, and I don't want, as I ask this, to make it sound like you've been in the business so long that I need to ask a historical question. Don't take it that way. You're certainly not a dinosaur, and I'm excited that, that you're here, uh, you know, just answering all these questions with me today. It's just amazing. But when you started, there were some of the old timers, certainly, were, were still around. Who are the characters that you remember? I'm always fascinated by numismatic history and who are, the, who are some of the old timers that you remember who maybe aren't with us anymore, who were real characters? You know, just a, a story that pops into your head about one of them, like the Pittman story, for example. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. So the, I, I mentioned to you earlier, I grew up in Clearwater, Florida. So I had the, uh, the luck. So in 1974, when I was 16, um, the, the ANA convention was in Miami. So uh, one, that was like, you know, I'd never been to Miami, uh, you know, I hadn't really traveled much. And one of the coin dealers uh, volunteered to take me down there and escort me down there. And I went down to the 1974 a and and it was at the Fountain Blue, which is, uh, I recently stayed there with my wife and it was kind of fun to see the old, you know, the old hotel, the site of the 1974 a and um, one of the, the, uh, the vivid memories I have was uh, uh, Abe Kossoff was there. And that was very late. I think he, I don't think he, I'm not sure he lived a whole lot longer after that, but he was there and he had uh, two showcases. He had a showcase on the right, one on the left. And in one showcase, he had an ultra high relief double eagle, 1907 ultra high relief. And the other case, which had recently sold for around $100,000, it kind of broke a new price record. In the other case, he had a, a, a mint condition uh, Syracuse decadram, and which I don't know what it, at the time had no idea. I mean, those are both like, you know, crazy coins to me at the time. But it was funny, he, uh, he was dressed in a, a, a white summer suit. And I was like, he was such, you know, such a striking character. And I just remember seeing Abe Kossoff at his, at his table. And, and, uh, and I was like, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty, pretty cool to see. And I still remember that. And that was, that was my first a show in 1974. And luckily I've uh, had the chance to go to every, um, every a a convention since, and I haven't missed one since 1974. So I've got a string going and um, I'll, t I'll tell you a funny story uh, that it's not about a character, but the 1975 a a was in Los Angeles which, you know, for a guy, for, you know, 17 year old kid in, in Florida, that was like, it could have been in Mars, you know, it was like forever, you know, it was a long ways away. So uh, I had no, no way, I, I didn't have any money at the time. And um, I was like, gosh, I really like to go to that show. And I went to one of my local Clearwater coin club. And there was one of the great characters at the time, uh, it was a guy named Colonel Jeffries, which a lot of people, you know, I don't know if you grew up in that area, you would probably know him. He was a, a really crazy character. And he had an 1839 half dollar uh, for sale and he sold it to me and it was mint condition, but he didn't realize it was a no drapery. And it was like something I'd studied. I realized it and I bought it and it made up. And I think I made like $500 on it. And that gave me the money to go to the 1975 uh, uh, a in Los Angeles. So it was really funny. My, uh, my, my little pick off of a variety you know, helped me go to that next coin show. And, you know, over the years, I've, I've, 
I've, I've really been lucky. I've got to know, you know, so many of the great characters in the business. I mean, there have been so many colorful people and, uh, you know, remember like in, that, in my area, there was uh, Robert Hendershot. He was a great character. I'm not sure if you, if you knew him back in the day. He, I know he, the name. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he, he, fam- he, he lived, I think he was 106 or so, uh, kind of like Eric Newman did. And uh, he went to the, uh, he went to the 1904 Louis, Louisiana uh, uh, World's Fair and he wrote a book about that about that later on, you know, the in, you know because he was a big collector of those. And I remember buying great coins from him and, and and some of the characters. But you know, some of the guys that I I really missed the most that became mentors was uh, David Akers was a was a really wonderful guy. He had an unbelievable memory. You know, buying coins from the tell me stories from the fifties and sixties. He was he was always shared with me, and um, he was a mentor, and and I, I learned a lot from him, and it was really really great. Um, even now, I consider Dave Bowers one of the great characters of all time. I, I consider you know myself lucky to call, to call him a friend, and uh, you know the things he shared with me and some of the stories. And um, but it's you know I'd have to make a list. It's I, I I've, I've really been lucky because I've done I've done points at the level where I got to know a lot of the great people, and it's been a lot of fun. And and uh, you know, but I, I'll never forget Abe Kossoff in his white suit. That's probably the most vivid one from my early early years. That's fantastic. Well, I, I know that, you know, we've been on for, you know, near, near, nearly an hour. So I just want to thank you for your time. And those are the questions that I'd prepared. I'm sure I could come up with a hundred more, but I, I really appreciate you taking the time to answer them. I appreciate Newman Numismatic Portal being willing to uh, support this, what's going to be a series of interviews that I'm going to do with folks. And of course, I appreciate everybody watching. This has been really fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, happy to happy to do it, and I, I'm really happy with the numismatic portal because, as we talked about it, numismatic education is the key to key to being a successful collector. So it's it's they, they people should utilize as much as they can. Awesome. Well, thank you so so much.